underwriting deals is such a major pain point for people. Most don't want to do it, and the people that are good at it are few and far between. That is why after six years of being in the industry and buying over 1,200 apartments, using my best-selling multifamily deal analyzer, I created Real Estate Lab, a full suite acquisition software for multifamily investors. We have built a product that helps investors automate their acquisitions and close more deals all in a cloud-based platform. You can go to realestatelab.com and sign up today using the promo code TAG2 for 10% off your first 12 months. This is David Tupin. Thanks for listening. Welcome to the Apartment Gurus, where we dive deep into all things multifamily investing. Our mission is to educate, inspire, and empower real estate investors to reach their highest potential. Each week, host Tate Seamer and co-host Chelsea Garber interview high-level guests from all over the industry who are sure to bring valuable, actionable ideas that will propel your business to the next level. Whether you're just starting out or a seasoned investor, you are in the right place. And now your hosts, the apartment gurus, Tate Seamer and Chelsea Garber. Welcome everybody back to another episode of the apartment gurus. And I am really excited about this one, everybody. I think that you're going to get a ton out of it. It's always exciting to have a broker on the show because as all of us know, uh, brokers are usually are often the key to uh, getting deals, getting good deals and your broker relations game and uh, the way that you, re- you know, the way that you relate to brokers and, and work with brokers is key to your success uh, in larger scale multifamily assets. And uh, today we have Mr. Bo Beery on the show. He's the author of I've got it right here. <laughs> My green screen's going to mess it up, but multifamily. Oh, there, there we go. Multifamily investors who dominate. It is a powerful book. The subtitle is an inside look at how elite investors transact. And coming from a broker um, that's had massive success and has done a huge amount of volume, it's extremely valuable to hear uh, Bo's perspective on what makes an elite investor, uh, how elite investors work, and and uh, from his perspective, how they relate to him, how they introduce themselves to him, how how they uh, respond to his, to him and sellers as far as offers go, how they present themselves to sellers and, and brokers. There's just a wealth of, of uh, in my opinion, critical information uh, in, in this book. And it is for me, it's foundational. Uh, it, it's it's very very unique. I've never seen another book written from the broker's perspective about how to be a good investor. And so, for listeners, like get this book. It's on Amazon. Um, and again, it's Bo Beery, which is spelled B E. Uh, e, sorry, B E E R Y. Right. And uh, so you'll you'll be able to find the book if you just uh, get on Amazon and look there. Bo, it's awesome to have you. I really appreciate being on the show. About the best damn introduction I've ever had, brother. I appreciate it. (laughs) (laughs) That's good. That's good. I meant every word of it. I I really did. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. I think what you've provided uh, in your book is is really generous. Number one, it's it's a very thoughtful thing to contribute value to the people that you serve and people that serve you and and uh, it, to me, it, it, like I said, it's just, it's critical stuff. And I've learned a lot from it. And we're going to dive into some of the, the key points of the book. Um, but first, if you would um, just kind of share a little bit about your backstory and uh, yeah. kind of, you know, how you got into real estate and, and, mm-hmm. and your real estate journey since then, and, and then kind of what you're up to today. Yeah, sure. Uh, So I graduated from the University of Florida with my undergrad in marketing uh, back in the late 90s. And I was going to go into personal training. Like that was my that was my thing. And I didn't get this one dream job I was after down in Orlando. And I was walking into the gym one day after I got the call that I didn't get the job. And a buddy of mine who um, had just started working as a leasing agent on site for a 400 unit apartment complex 
Um, he was, you know, basically right there when I walked in the gym and he asked me, Hey, how you doing? I'm like, ah, you know, I didn't get this job. He's like, dude, he's like, I don't know what you're up to. He said, but you know, we, we've got a, a new, an opening, you know, for a leasing agent to come on and, and help us with leasing and property management to new construction deal. You know, we've only built about half the units, but we're pre-leasing and all that. I'm like, I mean, I need a job. So yeah, sure. Sounds good to me. You know, like that, that was it, you know, and I, and I, I, I interviewed, got hired on uh, within within 90 days. I was the the top leasing guy there, and uh, wow. and just kind of learning from the ground floor, man. I mean, you know, showing showing apartments, taking phone calls from folks who have already moved in on work orders, handling disputes, learning you know lease negotiations, contract terms, you know, most frequent uh, repairs that happen. Um, watching how building plans are done, how buildings are added. You know, it was just a phenomenal start to what mm. became a great career. And, you know, I just didn't plan it. Uh, the owner of that complex with Tremel Crow Residential, which was one of the largest apartment developers in the country, which, you know, I didn't know at the time how good that was, uh, but they had a great training program and they would sometimes pay for education. So I was like, yeah, hey, maybe I'll, I'll go get my real estate license. Like I might as well just have one of those. And, you know, they paid for it. So I just got my real estate license. And while I was getting my real estate license, everybody during the licensure course was sent, was talking about this master's degree in real estate at the University of Florida. And they had one of the top five graduate real estate programs in the country. Hmm. And I was like, well, I'm not going to get into this, right? So I start talking to the admissions and, you know, you had to have a certain GMAT score, a certain GPA, you know, a number of years of work history. And so, you know, by that time, I was a couple years into doing the leasing gig. I had to take the GMAT several times, you know, mm-hmm. failed over and over again. Um, I had a, I had like a 3.2 GPA for my undergrad. It was just kind of okay, but I had this gorilla on my shoulder, which was Tremel Crow Residential, right? I got a big name. And so after a year straight of just smashing the admissions director, I finally got into the master's program. That program was a huge spark. And I was already in love with real estate at the time. I was watching essentially 800 people on this apartment complex pay for what at the time was about a $25 million asset. Hmm. Right. And I never saw the owners like, you know, like Joe Crow people didn't like just show up and, and walk the grounds. Like this was, you know, principal reduction was happening every single month. Values were going up, rents were going up. And I'm like, this is a crazy world. Like I got to be a part of this world. I mean, to think that you could have an asset like this, that asset just sold like four or five years ago for, um, God, it was something like 130 a doors, like 50, $60 million. Wow. I mean, it's worth it's worth probably two fifty a door today. Mm-hmm. It's it's just a phenomenal asset. It's right down the road for me here in Gainesville, and so I did the master's program. Met a ton of incredible people in real estate all across the U.S. Um, when I graduated, I worked I went and worked for a developer, an investor. We did office, retail, industrial, and multifamily, and I did the brokerage. I did the management, and then after a few years, I started doing acquisitions. So. I, I come into brokerage from a principal background, getting to learn how one of the best investors I've ever known, a guy named Mike Warren with AMJ, how he buys, how he analyzes, how he underwrites, what he looks for, how he communicated with brokers, um, and how he relied upon them to get deals done. And, you know, stumbling blocks along the way, things to look out for in PSAs. And so I just kind of had that as my firsthand knowledge while I was also brokering for him. Um, I worked for him for 10 years and an opportunity came available where I could acquire a Colwell Banker commercial franchise. Um, and I went right into multifamily doing brokerage. Um, I, I acquired that company with a couple of friends, owned that company for 10 years, um, was a top multifamily broker in Florida almost every year I was there. I was a top three in the world for Coal Banker Commercial for a nut for like, like the last six or seven years. Um, I sold back my share uh, to my partners and then started my own boutique multifamily brokerage firm in 2021. That's where I am, brother. Yeah. I cover the northern half of Florida. I do anything over 10 units and I do conventional and student housing only. Okay. Okay. Do you um do you own any property at this point? I I know a lot most brokers are are uh, just brokers, right? They 
They don't yeah. want to, um, for whatever reason, they, they stay away from being, uh, operators and whatnot. Uh, wh- what about you? So, um, I'm, I'm kind of a hybrid. I, I say that in that I would love to buy multifamily. Um, I'm, I'm probably in the minority of brokers that believe it is a conflict of interest for me to try to buy mm-hmm. assets that I could be taking to my customers in multifamily. Mm-hmm. I've looked at it every way, shape or form, and I find a conflict of interest in every route, right? Yeah. And if I start buying most investors, especially lead investors, they're tracking who the buyers and sellers are. And if they see my name pop up several times, they're not going to use me to sell their assets, right? Mm-hmm. They're going to see me as competition. If I start buying alongside them, they're going to expect preferential treatment on every listing and inside knowledge. I just can't give that, right? So it's just, I've looked at this over the last 20 years. It's very difficult. So I buy office retail and industrial only in my Gainesville market because I've been here forever and ever. And so I buy one to two assets per year. I always buy with a partner who owns a management company. That's my number one criteria because I don't have time to manage it. They pay themselves market rate management fees. um, And and basically, I've I've found most of the assets, partner with them. They manage it. Um, We put in half equity on each side. And that's worked well for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, a couple of things to highlight, I, I think, here out of your story is like so many people uh, that I've spoken to and that are very, very successful in what they do, you started out really as, uh, you know, not ground floor, but you started as a leasing agent. Yeah. And there's so much to learn from being in property management and being a leasing agent. And like uh, your perspective on uh, ownership in particular and, you know, what buyers and sellers need to know about management and, you know, the ins and outs of business plans and implementation of those, like that had to have been incredibly valuable for you. It really was. I I just, you know, to just, just getting the phone calls from tenants, Mm -hmm. uh, not just complaints, but, but things that they like, things that they don't like understanding floor plans that really work how to market to the tenant, the demographics, how to target tenants, um, you know, traffic patterns within the apartment complexes, where the dumpsters go, why you would do this and how you do that. Um, negotiating with vendors was, a, was another big one. Um, lease agreements and, and constantly updating and morphing your lease agreement because uh, you know lease agreements and purchase and sale agreements are basically a, a, a monument of failures, right? Mm-hmm. You know, every time you, every time you fail on something, you update your agreement, and so you know that was the most unintended, best first real career that I could have ever had. And a lot of times when I talk to young people wanting to get into real estate, Bo, I want to go into brokerage, Bo, I want to be a developer, whatever it is, I'm like, dude, management, finance, like. You know, being betting being a lender, like those yep. are really good bases. Appraisers, awesome bases. Yeah. Right. And by the way, you could get involved in those and then just stay in them and have great careers. It's not like it's this, you know, little podunk job. They're phenomenal careers in themselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And for listeners like that are looking to break into this space, uh, which I know a lot of my listener base is, a lot of my listeners have are, have done their first deal and are leveling up. Uh, but a lot of, a lot of the listeners are exploring, getting into the space and, and really wondering how to do that. We talk a lot on the program about, um, you know, paid internships, um, or unpaid internships. Uh, we talk about paid coaching, paid coaching programs, um, that you can enroll in that will get you started. But, you know, consider Bo's, uh, Bo's route to where he got, uh, which is, working in the industry and getting paid to do that and getting paid to learn, uh, the industry in a, in a position that is, you know, entirely hands-on and, uh, in in which you have contact with owners, tenants, obviously the, the property managers and, uh, you know, the, the important key people in the ownership of the asset, uh, you know, you're going to learn so much that you otherwise wouldn't. Uh, and, you know, I, 
I, I have a little bit of a, of a similar story in that, uh, but not really. I, we, you know, my, my partner, current partner and I have been working together for 11 years just in real estate. Uh, and we, we started in the single family world and, you know, mm-hmm. cut our teeth on flipping and, and doing that. And then we got into development and uh, entitlement and, and land entitlement and then some ground up development. And our education was largely in like, what we, what not to do, like, um, <laughs> models that models that didn't work for us and that, you know, we, we made money and, and did all right, but, uh, they just weren't anything like the, the multifamily space. And so for us, like when, when the multifamily opportunities came around and, you know, we had one basically fall on our lap, a little 12 unit here in Salt Lake, uh, it was incredibly eye-opening for us because the contrast between underwriting a deal that cash flows and that has rents that pay the mortgage and pay the expenses and everything versus what we had been doing, which was a hundred percent speculative, uh, you know, it was, it was like night and day. And so, you know, we, we got a crash course education and what, and how really, in my, my opinion, not to do real estate. Um, <laughs> if we had if we had been buying and holding, that would have been a different story. I think there's a a very good model there. But um, sure. but anyway, it's a great way to start at your career. And so you know, consider. Well, and, and if you're you know when you're starting in in management or appraisal or lending or whatever, the thing is is if you've got the it factor you're going to be exposed to high level stuff quickly, right? They're not, yeah. You're not going to just be leasing apartments at $35,000 a year. They're going to recognize if you're somebody who should be at a whole different level, they're going to want to move you up into different things. And that's how a lot of big guys in multifamily investing who own large corporations, if you hear all their stories, they started in spots and they climbed the ladder and they started learning the different trades within the field. Mm-hmm. And then once they had enough experience, they became a monster. Yeah. That's killer stuff. And so what would you say that the it factor is? <laughs> Honestly, the, the number one factor is this, um, this tenacity, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, I've, I've talked about this in a couple of podcasts and the best way I can explain is this, is this example. So, you know, when you're out on the soccer field as a parent, right? And we, we've all been there, you know, our, our eight-year-olds, our 10-year-olds, whatever it is. So it's on a Saturday and you go to the soccer field and there's, you know, 25 soccer fields out there and there's kids playing all over the place, different age brackets. And, you know, there's 200 kids out there, right? And there's always these two or three kids that are just absolutely lunatics in a good way. Like, I mean, they're the ones who are elbowing, pushing, diving. They've got blood down their elbows and knees. They get absolutely irate when they lose. They're super passionate, but they're grinders and, Mm -hmm. and their skills aren't always phenomenal, but their, 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 their ability and their tenacity um, to win is what every employer is looking for. Right. Mm, yeah. I mean, it's it's what's lacking so much, especially in brokerage. You know, brokerage is it's easy to get a real estate license. That's the problem. Right. Anybody can get a freaking real estate license. And so the ones who have that that tenacity combined with even just some minor education can really excel. Mm-hmm. Right. Same thing in real estate, same thing in brokerage, all these things. Like when you sit down with folks, what's lacking the most when you talk to people who are hiring these folks, it's the ones who look in your eyes, who have that fire, who have that you know, that, that voice. And you can just tell when you're in their presence for 10 seconds, this dude or this gal is legit. Like I got to, I don't have a position. I'm going to find a position for this guy. Cause he ain't leaving my office until I hire him. Yeah. That's, That's a great what, description. Yeah. 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 I love it. And you had me at soccer. I grew up playing soccer and uh, I'm a huge professional soccer fan. I have had season tickets to our local team, uh, our local MLS team. Uh, awesome. here. Yeah. For like 11 years, I've been, I've been a crazy fan and, and you're right. The, the truly tenacious players just yes. stand out. You know, they, they are, uh, there, there's a real difference between a, a, a very talented, uh, almost like prima donna type player. Who's had, he's really had it easy. Like they, they can lean yeah. on their talent uh, and, 
uh, you know, for they can lean on their talent for playing time and success on the field and everything else. But the scrappy player that isn't as talented uh, that that needs to be, you know, just hungry and tenacious yeah. on the field just stands out. And you, as a fan, you love those players. Like, yeah, they're your they, favorite players. They find a way to get it done. I, when yeah. I when I owned the Colwell Banker commercial with my partners, we had about a hundred agents. Right, we had seventy five or eighty residential agents. The rest were commercial guys. My partners ran the residential side. I ran the commercial side. But what we noticed over that ten year period was, you know, there were agents, which were most of the agents that we would bring on, and they were just okay. Right, mm-hmm. some of them would complain that the training wasn't there or that the market wasn't right, or the seller wasn't doing this. There was just, you know, they just they just needed hand-holding a lot, right? Yeah. They'd still make a hundred grand, right? But then there was always those one or two that would come along that just, I, we never even had to have a sit down. They just craved the information. They went after it. They listened to every video, read every book, every manual. They were up at night. They did open houses. They just bam, 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 bam. And they were making a quarter million dollars in a few years. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just, yeah. it's just that it factor, man. I mean, and, and, and you can, I don't, I don't know if you're born with it or not. That, that's the, that's the, I don't know if, if that's something you can develop. I think it's something you either got or you don't. Um, but it yeah. sure is nice if you got it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, that's awesome. Well, before we, uh, kind of dive in here, um, I have, I have a couple questions for you, uh, just on a getting to know you kind of level. What do you like to do for fun, Bo? Oh man, it's all cars. It's my, Car- my whole life is, is that's awesome. uh, getting on the track with cars, wow. um, car shows, uh, detail. I'm big time, big time into detailing cars. Cool. Uh, I'm a huge Porsche fanatic. Um, so like I this remember weekend, that from your book, actually, uh, the brand yeah. of Porsche is like, it, 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 as I remember, it's like the most, the world's most recognized brand. Is that correct? It's the number one luxury brand in the world. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Like, you know, I mean, even among like Louis Vuitton and, you know, and, and you know, the, the watch companies, not number one luxury brand. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, that is amazing. That's fun. It's just a cool culture. I just like being around cars. It's just a neat culture. Um, the the you know just the engineering, the friendships, the camaraderie, and it's a you know every all of us need that that side fun from real estate, right? Real estate is yeah. intense. Yeah, it, absolutely. It requires all of your attention, and it's just I, I'm a big fan of having something on the side that you're passionate about. Yeah, work hard, play hard for yeah. sure. I I know yeah. that. The weeks that are the most intense for us are the you know the weekend following. I make a point of camping or mountain biking or, or skiing or you know something that I'm super passionate about that feeds me and feeds my energy and my yeah. soul and everything else. And it sounds like you have a true passion for cars, and it makes sense to me that uh, you know people that are super successful uh, that that work you know, lots of hours and, and work intensely have these hobbies that they're also really passionate about because it's such a good balance in life. Occasionally I'll talk to somebody who is just like, oh, it works my hobby. And, you know, and then, uh, you know, I just, I can barely spend enough time or find enough time to spend with my family, that sort of thing. And, yeah, and I, and I get that, but I think, and that maybe is a certain personality uh, type, but it, but more often than not, you know, people that are passionate about their work are also passionate about all the rest of their life, like their physical health, their spiritual health, sure. their, their family life, and, and certainly their recreational life. And I think that's really important to have passions that, that, that really feed you. And yeah. Otherwise, what are we doing this for? Like, what well, I mean, yeah. you know, to me, I mean, you know, a lot of people say, Oh, I love real estate. It's fun. It's, you know, it, it's hard, man. Like it's, yeah. you know, you're dealing with, you're dealing with very wealthy people, big egos, lots of negotiating, lots of things can go wrong, super high risk. Um, you having to predict what's going to happen in the future. Like it's intense. Yeah. What people love are the results. I get that part of it. Right. But it's a really intense environment. And so to have, you know, to have that end goal that you're doing it all for is what's, what it's all about for, for me. Um, real estate yeah. is not my passion. Cars is my passion, but real estate I'm good at, and it gets me what I want. Yeah. Yeah. It, you know, and, and that's a good segue into the book. I think, uh, the last chapter of the book is, is called family and friends first. 
Mm. And I love that because it speaks to priorities and yeah. it's, it speaks to core values. And, you know, if you have family and friends first in life, in my opinion, you've got your, you've got your priorities, right. And you understand why you're doing what you're doing. Uh, and so I really appreciate you putting that yeah. in the book, you know, the biggest thing is setting limits for yourself, man. Cause real estate, like any other industry, it can take over your life. You literally can work 24 yeah. seven and never catch up. Just, yep. and the thing is, is the better you are at it, the more work it can be, right? Cause people yeah. want to, more investors want to be with you and more people want you to buy more assets. And you could just, you could literally just go constantly until you, so unless you set up systems and parameters and time limits on your life so that you can have a private life with family, friends, and hobbies, man, you're eventually going to hit a wall. Like I talked about in the chapter with my buddy of mine. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of people like that. Yeah, totally. So, um, uh, elite investors, like I love the, I love the, co- uh, the concept. I love the languaging of that. And, uh, it's something that somebody like myself certainly aspires to. And, uh, y- your book really gets into what makes an elite investor and how they work and, and how they think and, and how they relate and how they compensate even like stuff like that. So I could obviously kind of share my thoughts on the book and, and I've, I've read it and, uh, I've given it away and I'm giving it away tomorrow at a, at a meetup group. And I just think it's amazing, but would you maybe just kind of give the book a little intro for in your own words? Yeah. So, you know, I I've been in the business now a little over 20 years doing brokerage, right. And, And a little over half of that has been only in multifamily and, what I've noticed, and, and almost all my sales have been investment sales. Mm-hmm. And so I've been tracking what I call elite investors, which I've calculated, literally calculated to be a little bit less than one half of 1% wow. of all investors. Wow. Now, listen, there's a whole lot of investors in between that that are phenomenally wealthy that I, that I, don't, I don't consider to be elite. Um, uh, elite is, is doing a lot of the things right that we'll talk about, but mostly it's the number of deals you're doing a year consistently, right? And the only way you can do lots of deals per year consistently over a 20-year period is if you're elite and doing the things right that we talk about in the book. But I wrote the book because I see these few folks who are just wildly successful at their business. I mean, you know, like, you know, there's uh, for instance, in whatever industry you are, right? You have the average person right here, then you have a really good dude who's just killing it, whether it's lots of sales or, or whatever. The, and then you have these folks that are at this next echelon mm-hmm. and, and people don't even compare themselves to these elite people. Like they're just like, oh yeah, that's that guy, Bob. Like <laughs> he's been doing this for 20 years. He's, he's an animal. Right? Mm-hmm. Like we, we, we don't compare ourselves. That's who I'm writing about. These are the folks that are just lights out consistently over a 10, 15, 20 year period. They're always doing tons of deals. They're who every broker on the planet thinks about the second they kind of call from a seller who's even thinking about selling. I'm already thinking of a few guys who want this asset that I want to do this deal with because they're so good to do deals with, right? Mm -hmm. But I also wrote the book because I see so many folks do things wrong, not because you know they're purposely acting in that manner, but they don't know the inside look at how the conversations are between brokers and sellers. They don't know how buyers get chosen. They don't know how offers get chosen. They don't know that little word they put in that one little paragraph of that letter of intent completely screwed them. Right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so I, I watched a lot of good people who I'd like to do deals with just do things wrong and they shoot themselves in the foot right off the bat. Mm-hmm. So I said, well, let me just let me just start taking some notes on how these these top, top guys operate. I'm going to put them all into these chapters. And a lot of it has to do with 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 sort of two things. Number one is it's it's integrity. It's treating people right. It's empathy. Um, not retrading. There's a whole lot of things like transactional things, but the majority of it is the numerical fact that brokers, multifamily brokers are doing over 90% of every multifamily transaction that happens, particularly over 10 units, but mostly over 20, 40, 50 units, right? And the bigger the asset, the higher that percentage is. And it's not because multifamily brokers are you know, amazing people, right? It's just when you think about it intellectually, the guy who owns a 75 unit, $8 million asset, 
Why would he entertain a call from some rando guy off the street that says, hey, my name's, you know, Tate. Uh, I see your eight million, you know, your asset over on one, two, three Main Street looks beautiful. We're an investment company. We've bought this, this, and this. You ever thought about selling? Like, why would he entertain an offer from you off the street when he can call a multifamily broker and in three weeks have 25 offers yeah. and then get those folks to compete against each other and bid it up, right? So most folks who own these assets, they want to be exposed to the market. They want to get the maximum price. And now, nowadays, more and more and more of these investment groups are syndicators yeah. and nationals and REITs. The mom and pops can't even survive anymore today, right? Yeah. Like the single investor who you know bought quads and duplexes and then became then bought twenty plexes and fifty plexes. Like those guys, they're 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 getting eaten up. They're they're being bought out by syndicators and syndicators in particular owe to their investors the exposure to the market, right? So the point of the book is if the vast majority of all transactions are happening as a result of brokers beating investors to the punch, meaning finding these assets before other investors do, then wouldn't the vast majority of your time be better well spent networking and developing that pipeline with brokers rather than trying to find the needle in the haystack widow who just inherited 150 units from her husband who just died. Mm -hmm. And you called her at the exact moment and she's not represented by an estate attorney yet and sells it to you for some 10% discount, mm -hmm. which never happens. Right. Mm -hmm. And even if it did happen and you, even if it happened every year, once a year, Okay, which is not going to ever happen. But if it happened once a year, great. But I know guys who are doing 10 and 15 deals a year every year for 20 years, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So the book is hey, this is the inside look at how to getting every multifamily broker to salivate over calling you before it's even hit the market. So this is what happens, Tate. Sam, the seller, calls up Bo, the broker, and says, Bo, my partners and I, you know, our, our loans coming up in June of 2023, we're really going to refi, we're going to sell, we're not sure yet. We know you're the man down there in Florida. We'd love you to do a BOV on this asset. And if we like what you're, what you're, you know, what you say, we might let you go take a run at it, right? At that moment, I don't even have a listing agreement yet. I haven't gotten any financials yet. I'm already thinking about a certain number of investors who I want to do this deal with. Yeah. People who I trust, who consistently pay the right price. They close on time. They don't retrade. Their due diligence is smooth. They're cordial. My seller falls in love with these guys every single time, which makes me look good. I, I'm, now, I'm already thinking about the second transaction. I want to try to get this buyer to buy from the same seller. That's the kind of guy I'm already thinking of. Yeah. And I call those guys right off the bat. Hey, Tate, just got a call from Sam, the seller. I don't have the listing yet, but they want me to do a BOV. I can't share any financials with you. That's, you know, that's, that's confidential information. I just want to tell you which complex it is. And these guys already know, you know they're not going to go out to the complex and start walking around and talking to staff, right? Mm -hmm. But what these guys do know is they can already start you know, looking at what the rents are and what they can earn after a remodel. They're already talking to their contractor about some of the renovations they can do. They're already talking to their debt guy about what's available. They're mm -hmm. already talking to their property managers about what leasing rates could be and how they would manage it and what the efficiencies are. So what happens is, is three weeks later, after I've already gotten the listing, built a drop box of all the due diligence items, put together my marketing package, and now I've gone to market, the top guys that every broker is like have already gotten a three-week head start, mm. which is why there's a dozen offers in 10 days, right? right? And they know the market like the back of their hands, right? right? And so that's how a lot of these deals get done. Now, my, these guys who we all think of, they still have to compete, right? They're, they're still going to have to compete against others who turn in offers. There's likely still going to be a call for offers. Sometimes the seller may want to take an offer from these guys and just do a deal with them before going to call for offers. But most of the time, there's a call for offers. But who am I going to fight for? 
right? I'm going to fight for these guys right. um, because they're going to pay the best price in terms. They're going to show up to closing. And that's what sellers work. Sellers are already, they already know they're going to get the right price in terms. Otherwise, they're not going to sign a contract. What they want is who's going to show up to closing and with the least amount of drama. Right, right. That's what every seller wants. Yeah. So on that note, do you ever, uh, do you ever do an off market type scenario where you you take a deal to one, two, three investors? Usually that's done. My understanding is that's done at the seller's request where they don't want necessarily the public to know that they're selling for whatever reason. Does that happen in your world often? So phenomenal question, probably one of the most hotly debated and most often question I get. And let me explain to you what off market is, uh, because there's a huge, there's a huge, you know, sort of range of what people think are off market. Um, I think back in the day, off market to a buyer meant that, you know, a broker heard about a guy who might sell and he called only Tate and gave only Tate a shot at this asset and they did a deal, right? Yeah. yeah. The reality is that makes no sense whatsoever to a seller. Why would a seller allow Bo to go to one human being and one human being only to bring, to bring some, some price that they don't even know is the highest price that can be achieved because it hasn't been exposed, right? It, it, it's happened. Don't get me wrong. What, what off-market is today, when you go on LinkedIn and you see the hundreds of posts about people getting an off-market deal, which think about it, it's not possible that every goddamn post that happens on LinkedIn <laughs> is an off-market deal. It's impossible, right? right? Yeah. But what they're saying is it's not on a website. Yeah. That's really what off-market is today, is that it's not on LinkedIn or not on, on LoopNet and, and CoStar and, and blasted on all the social media websites and then email blasted 10,000 people. So what happens is a seller will call Bo and say, hey, Bo, we are thinking about selling our asset. Um, we finally got awesome management in place. So we don't want them to find out about it. Um, we don't want our tenants to learn about it. So you know, we're, we're going to give you the exclusive. Uh, you know, let's negotiate our commission. We'll pay you this. We just don't want to see it on websites. We want you to control who it goes to. Okay. Yeah. That's the off market deal of today. However, with today's technology, every broker has in their database every human being on planet Earth that wants to buy that asset. We don't need websites. Zero multifamily transactions happen on LoopNet or CoStar or any websites. Nobody ever sells to some guy who emails them off LoopNet, not mm -hmm. for multifamily, right? Don't get now. I keep saying nobody. It's ever happened. It's happened. I'm just saying as a percentage, it hardly ever happens mm -hmm. because we already have everybody in our database. So what I do is when I get 150 convention, 150 unit conventional listing that's built in 1972 in Jacksonville, I already can query 10,000 people in my CRM down to the only 117 investors in the world who want this exact kind of asset down to the brick. And I'll shoot them an email about this ad set. I'll follow up with a few phone calls to my best folks. And that's an off-market deal. Now, you know, you're, you're still competing against 117 phenomenal investors or 500 phenomenal investors. You're just not competing against tens of thousands. But the reality is those 117 have been chosen as killers. Right. Right. right? And now there are also another off market type where, in my opinion, this is more of a true off market. Tate's driving through Daytona Beach with his wife on vacation and Tate sees a 62 unit deal that's you know, in a great location. It's you know, got nice flowers out of the sign. He's like, man, I would really like to own an asset like that. It looks just like the one that I have over in Salt Lake, right? So he calls up Bo because he knows Bo works the Daytona Beach market. He says, Bo, you know, I just drove by you know XYZ Apartments over on Main Street. Do you know who owns that? And I'm like, well, yeah, I know who owns that. You know, Sam Smith owns that. I've called him twice about selling, but it's been about a year, Tate. I don't know. It might be time for I can I can give him a call. 
right? I'll tell you what, Tate, send me an email that you and your wife are driving through. You saw this asset. Tell me a little bit about, you know, you know send me the list of assets that you own. I'll also talk you up. I'll then take your email. I'll forward it to the seller so he knows I'm not just some, you know, another broker just saying, hey, I got a guy, right? Here's the actual person. Here's how he found it. And I'll let, I'll, let, I'll let Sam, the seller, know, hey, this guy, Tate, I've done two deals with him. He owns a bunch of assets in Salt Lake. He's bought a couple of assets in Florida. He's looked to pick up some more assets in Daytona Beach. He saw your, 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 your deal. I know it's not on the market. Would you entertain just a quick offer? Mm. And in the off chance, he says, yes, that's another off market opportunity. And those happen, right? Because number one, that seller already knows me. He knows I ain't coming to him with some Tom, Dick, and Harry. I'm coming to him with Tate, who knows his shit, who's closed with me before, who I can vouch for, mm-hmm. right? So he may entertain something like that. Right. But yep. the, the, you know, the, the, the off market where a broker called three people to try to sell an asset makes zero intellectual sense whatsoever. My job, my fiduciary job, is to get the highest price in the fastest time from the best buyer who's going to show up to closing and not make me look like an idiot, right? Mm -hmm. And I can't do that at showing it to two people because two people could take three weeks to underwrite it and -hmm. neither one of them could bring the right price. And now I've lost three weeks. And if it is a true off-market deal where I don't have the exclusive listing, I already know this seller, I'm not stupid, this seller is talking to probably two other brokers, Mm -hmm. right? So I'm racing against two other brokers who are selling it off market to several other buyers. So my job, if I, if I, and if I, actually, have, if I actually know that assets are for sale, but I don't have the exclusive, but he'll pay me, I'm in a race, brother. Yeah. yeah. And I may not be talking to 500 people, but I'm in a race to talk to as many people as I can, as fast as I can to find the right buyer, to bring the right offer and get this under contract. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's an off market deal. Yeah. Yeah. And, and but you're just, always in competition is the moral of the story. You're yeah. always in competition. Yeah. As whether soon as you think you're the only human being looking at this and that you have all the time in the world and that you've got this seller's captive mind is horseshit. Ain't happening. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'll just add uh, our experience in this realm. Uh, you know, first of all, as far as the, the, what to reference Bo's story about calling uh, sellers directly um, trying to catch them at the right time, whether it's a, you know, a death where uh, somebody's inherited a property or, you know, something along those lines. We, we tried for uh, basically a year uh, with, a, with a cold caller here in our, on our team that was calling direct to seller, um, making direct to seller calls and trying to uh, rustle up deals that way. And we had remarkably low success. And I think it really speaks to the fact what Bo said earlier about the 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 intelligence and experience of these sellers. You know, somebody that owns 100 units or 150 units, they're likely pretty savvy business people and investors. Right. They understand the market. They understand how things sell. And why? Like Bo said, why would they possibly go to you as an individual buyer uh, when they can expose their property to to the market, which is you know literally thousands of buyers, and and get the best get the best deal and have it be handled by a pro that understands how to make transactions go smoothly, quickly, efficiently, and and get to the finish line. So, well, and not only that, it's, you know, I talk about this in my opening chapter of the book, which is the, the, the extremely small statistics of the number of owners that control all these assets. I cover the entire Northern half of Florida, right? Which mm-hmm. is arguably one of the top five markets in the country for multifamily. Absolutely. Right? There's only 996 human beings, companies, corporations, REITs in the universe that own every one of those assets over 10 units. That's it. 996. Yeah. Right? There's only about 300 that own all the ones over 100 units. 300 people. I've had parties in my freaking house with more than 300 people, right? <laughs> 300 people own all these assets, right? Yeah. And those 300 people know the 50 multifamily brokers that work the northern half of Florida. 
And on the 80-20 rule, there's really 20% of us brokers or about a dozen of us that are really doing all the volume. Yeah. And so the reason they're not entertaining the cold callers call is because they want to know who these people are. The brokers know who the buyers are. I can tell the seller, oh yeah, this is Tate. He owns this, 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 and this. I do two deals with him. One of them went smooth. One of them, he did this. So we have to be cautious, right? Yeah. And I know how to get the buyer up. I know what their pain points are, where their equity comes from, how they source their debt, how their investors do things. You know, you know, Do they ever have to extend on closings? This kind of education the seller wants to hear. They also, most of the sellers I work with, they want that person in between so they can be tough. Yeah. yeah. Right? A lot of these investors, especially elite guys, they're nice people. They're cordial. You know, they want the person in between to be able to, you know, to, you know, to good cop, bad cop is, is, is a, is a bad description, but they want someone in between there to, to look out for their interest yeah. and convey a message in a certain tone. Yeah. It's, it's, it's called leverage, right? It's like the, a, a smart business person investor is going to leverage an agent, a, a broker to, like you say, be tough to fight their fight for them uh, to present, you know, maybe an, a, maybe responses, counter offers, et cetera, that the buyer's not necessarily going to like or whatnot. And, uh, you know, a good savvy broker that, you know, the 80 20 rule, the 20% type broker is going to be able to do, have the tough conversations, present the tough items, and also really um, keep the relationship. Um, positive and and productive moving yeah. forward. So yeah, great, great example. Tate is here's a way to drive home the off market thing. I don't, I don't want to is when you put your let's say you put your house for sale, right? Can you imagine Tate? You put your house for sale, and you're doing it open. Let's say you did it for sale by owner. Okay, or, or, or you know you did it for sale by owner. Buyers walk in on an open house, and they want you to sit down at the dinner table. And let's negotiate my purchase price right here. Terms, every let's let's negotiate it right now, mm -hmm. right? It would make you feel real weird, right? Yeah, you want you'd want to have time to you know, but if you had a broker, right, who is is acting as the in between, you have time to think about it. You yeah. know, you have time to get market research. Like it would feel very uncomfortable for the first person to walk in on an open house. And they want you to do a deal right there, right then and there before they leave. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You would be feeling like as a homeowner, God, I wonder if I'm leaving too much on the table. I don't, I don't, you know, maybe this island is the right price. Should I give them this much of an inspection period? Like it's an uncomfortable feeling. That's why you have one of the reasons you have brokers in there. Yeah. Yeah. And listen, if you have it, listen, if you have a team of six acquisition guys, okay, I'm all for having one of them or two of them dedicated to making these calls directly to, 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 uh, to owners. Why not? I mean, I, you know, uh, as long as they're good on the phone and they're not going to hurt your reputation, yeah. which is a big if, right? Right. If you've got some 22 year old kid making phone calls for you and they're calling some of these folks and, and they call them seven times because they own seven assets in the market. Right. And they're saying the same things. They've now killed Tate's reputation. Right. Yeah. But the other four acquisition guys, if they're dedicated to just developing a relationship with Bo and all the other brokers, and I'm not talking about taking us out to dinner and all that crap. I'm just saying like, like, you know, value adding to each other and developing a relationship over a 10 or 15 year period. Those are the guys I think of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're actually, we've, we're, we're a little limited on time here, but I want to, no uh, I want to hit on a couple of key things in the book. You know, chapter three talks about, uh, having deals brought to you, which is what you want. Um, and that doesn't, like Bo said, that usually doesn't mean that they're bringing a broker is bringing the deal only to you. Uh, but if they are bringing a broker, if they're a broker is bringing a deal to you, they have picked you out as somebody that they want to work with, that they feel is qualified to do the deal. And also that they vetted the deal for you a little bit, right? Like they understand right. why it's a good deal. A quick side note, we have doubled down completely on broker relationships and have 
uh, have left the direct to seller model long behind uh, for all the reasons that you talked about. And, and also one more reason, which is we don't want to compete with brokers for their listings. And wh- I mean, yeah. why do that? Right. Like well, you can, it's all we do. I mean, think about it. Yeah. We wake up at six o'clock in the morning and all we eat, breathe, sleep and shit is beating investors to the punch, finding yeah. listings so we can list them. Yeah. Right? yeah. You guys so, have so many more important things to do. You're, you're finding debt, negotiating yep. the equity, finding investors, all these things, way more important things to do. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, and we're free. Right. We, we like work for your firm for free. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and so there's so many advantages to, uh, you know, to being, to working with brokers and becoming an elite investor uh, and making, you know, or striving to become a, an elite investor that, a, a broker will bring uh, deals to, um, you know, this, this is going to touch on probably a lot of the book, but what are the most important things that you see in your elite investors, the ones that are on your short list? What are the common qualities that you see there? Yeah. Um, you know, I talk about, they, they are phenomenal at frequent automated connections with brokers. So, these these same folks call me on a regular basis every 30 to 60 days. Mm. And they just check in with me. Bo, what are you working on? How's the family? What'd you do over the weekend? You know, it's kind of like personal, personal, personal business, right? Yeah. Yeah. And and you know, you do that every 30 to 60 days over a five and 10 year period, you become like friends and buds. You know, I mean, as a matter of fact, our conversations become shorter and shorter and shorter. Because we're, we're so much like, you probably have college buddies, Tate, that your phone conversations last like two minutes. Like, hey, you know, hey, asshole, you know, you're going to show up this weekend over at the hiking place. Yeah, yeah, great. See you there. You know, yeah. and it's just like, you know, boom, they're just they're quick phone calls, right? And so they're really good at consistently checking in because you're only as good as your last touch, right? Now, the, the amount of touches is important, but it's just checking in on a regular basis. The other thing is, is that, they are enormously empathetic during mm. transactions, leading up to transactions, after transactions. What I mean by that is, you know, when they submit letter of intent, they're thinking about the seller. How can I get the seller to accept my offer? What are some of their pain points? What are they looking for? When you're negotiating that now you've got an accepted of letter of intent, now you're negotiating a PSA. When the seller redlines a bunch of your stuff, instead of blowing up and, and thinking the seller is insane for some of the red lines they did, which is what most investors do, they actually think to themselves, okay, well, why they red line that? What were they thinking? What's their pain point there? Ah, I bet it's this right here. Okay, here's how I think I can address that, mm-hmm. right? When they're doing walkthroughs during due diligence, they're complementing the assets, right? They're, they're complementing the management, um, when they're setting up their, their walkthroughs and due diligence, they're asking what times are best for the seller to do this. And they're asking which people they might have available to do the walkthroughs instead of saying, we're walking through on this day. We need all of your staff members. We need, you know, it's like just little small things like that, right? That you don't think about. Their whole goal is what I've noticed most on everything their whole goal during a transaction is how can I complete this sale so that this seller falls in love with me mm. so that the second transaction we may do together is so much easier. I want Bo to be able to call me the next time this seller sells something. And he's calling me because he's already gotten that seller's buy-in to take it to me right away and see if I want to buy it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so it just... They, they make their next transaction so much easier and easier. And it's like a snowball, man. You can think about how when you're operating as just a, in a gentleman and gentlewoman-like manner consistently and empathetically thinking of others on a regular basis and not showing your ass and retrading terms and talking down and being a bull in a china shop. And you know the, the folks who think about like winning every negotiation versus the win-win and walking away with your with your with your reputation in hand. Yeah. They they never build a big portfolio, but the guys who are always thinking of others, it's like as the years roll on, all the deals come to them. 
Mm-hmm. They don't even have to hard, hardly even search out for stuff. When they walk in their office, their inbox and their emails already have deals for them to look at. Mm-hmm. And they're one of the few who get to look at them right away. Yeah. yeah. My book goes into super detail about all kinds of different situations and, and, and ways in which these elite guys have built the reputation, but it's all about reputation. Yeah. Yeah. I would, uh, I'd say there's an underlying current there too of humility. Like I, I think that, you know, it, it, in general, as an entrepreneur, these uh, you mentioned empathy, you mentioned win-win. Th- those require a, a humble uh, perspective, a humble approach to business, and uh, you know, authenticity's got to be another one too, where you feel like this person's being real with you that. Uh, they don't have uh, they don't have a hidden agenda or an axe to grind or anything like that. Uh, that that you're dealing with, uh, you know, a person of depth, a person of character, and uh, you know, a person that is is humble. And you know, you can be you can be very very confident and very very good at what you do and still be very humble. And yeah, uh, I think that's that's a huge takeaway. It is, yeah. but you know we're we're in a business with with mostly very very wealthy males in their you know forties to seventies, yeah. right? That don't need to buy the next deal. They don't need to sell the next deal. And what happens is with some investors is it becomes uh, you know ego and winning becomes more important than the actual money. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And so when I say it, my I mean is you can insult them very quickly. Right. Yep. You insult them on something in a, in, a, in a contract or a due diligence or a walkthrough or whatever. They're just like, I don't need to sell this. Yeah. <laughs> I've got right. 150 million in the bank. Bo, Bo, tell them to walk. Right. But all you had to do is be nice and cordial and, and, and yeah. go through with these things. And so, you know, these folks don't have to transact with you. They aren't. That a lot of times they're not making financial decisions, right? Yeah. A financial decision would be, yeah, let's just move forward with this guy. I know he's a prick. Let's just move forward with this guy and close, right? Yeah. But a lot of them just kind of like, <laughs> I don't need you. See ya. Yeah. And the deal yeah. goes away. Right. Well, this has been amazing. Um, unfortunately, we're we're up against time here, Bo. I want to encourage listeners to go right now to Amazon. Uh, is that the best place to get it, Bo? Amazon. Yeah, Amazon. Okay. You can get it on Audible. You can get it on Amazon as a hardcover, and you can get it on Kindle. Yeah, and I have it on Audible too. It's great. Uh, but here it is again: multifamily investors who dominate. How the how uh, an inside look at how elite investors transact. This book is gold, guys. Go get it if you're serious about getting good big deals. Go get it. And uh, so, Bo, what's what's the best way for a listener to reach out with you? And maybe they're in Florida and they want to yeah. uh, they want to join your buyers list. What's what's the best way to reach out to you? Sure, two ways. My website is bobeery.com. And whether you are a buyer in Florida or not, the reason you want to go to my website is I have phenomenal stats and resources on my landing page. And then at the very top of my website, there's a section called resources. Mm -hmm. I have letter of intent templates. I have incredible stats. The markets I cover, the reason you want to click on the markets I cover, whether you buy in them or not, I want you to see the kind of stats and things that I track. Because if you can master those buttons for your markets, you'll be a killer. Mm -hmm. Because this business is a lot about reaction time. Right, you've got two or three weeks to to produce an offer and master that product in that submarket. Right. The second way to reach out to me is you you got to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Mm. I have a YouTube channel called Bo Knows Multifamily. I put out a video a week. Um, when you once you subscribe and hit the bell, you'll be notified every week. And I and I and I do all kinds of of stories, uh, teaching lessons, things I've I've experienced. And what should have been done better or what has been done great. And it's just, it's all transactional, really good stuff that you'll be able to learn along the way. Mm -hmm. So, and then Bo knows multifamily listeners, Bo is spelled B-E-A-U. Any material coming from Bo, in my opinion, is do not miss, must see TV. So uh, I'm looking for, actually, I hadn't been subscribed uh, to your channel and Looking for, I, I just pulled it up. I'm, I just, just hit subscribe. So I'm looking forward awesome. to delving into that. So, Bo, 
thank you so much. This has been fantastic. Uh, I, I've gotten a lot out of it. I've gotten a ton out of your book and I know that our listeners will too. So I really appreciate it. Well, I appreciate you, Tay. You've been a great supporter of me and thank you so much for the exposure here. Yeah. And, and listeners, I didn't mention this to, uh, to, to you, but I bought 20 of Bo's books and I give them out whenever, uh, whenever I meet somebody on a podcast or yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, somebody that I think is going to get a lot out of it. So that's how much I believe in this. Um, I'm, I was really, really excited when Bo agreed to do the podcast. And so hopefully you got a ton out of this and, uh, and we'll follow through, get the book and become an elite investor and have deals brought to you. That's the idea. So thanks again, Bo. Thanks again, listeners. We appreciate you and we'll see you on the next episode. Take care, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Apartment Gurus with Tate Seymour. Tate and Chelsea are grateful to have you as a loyal listener. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe, rate and review and share with friends on your Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or any other podcast platform. Also check out Tate's YouTube channel for videos of many of these episodes and more. Until next time, take massive action steps and rock on.